everybody. Good to see you. I'm speaking through Matthew. We've got to chapter 9, and we, we, we read today about Matthew, the tax collector. Now, in my sermon, or in my message, I'm going to mention Alcoholics Anonymous, AA. AA, now keep that in mind, because it'll come back later on. We are, we are reading about Matthew. Now, in chapters 8 and 9, Jesus performs a number of miracles, and the word about that is spreading. And so that gives part of the background for what's happening with Matthew in, in verse 9 and following. Let's read it. It'll be on the screens for you as well. As Jesus went on from there, now in the first part of the chapter, he heals a paralyzed man. I think the same story you find in Luke's gospel as well, where he was lowered down to the roof of a house by four of his friends, and Jesus heals this paralyzed man. But more than that, he forgives that man of his sins. So as Jesus went on from there, the healing of that man, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked him, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. And he quotes from Hosea chapter 6, Old Testament prophet. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus can change your life in just one moment. This is what happened with Matthew. Our Lord looked at him and said, come, follow me. And the amazing thing is that Matthew got up at that moment and followed Jesus. He left his old life behind and began a whole new life with Jesus, and it happened in just one moment. Now, I think that Matthew had heard something about the miracle-working rabbi named Jesus, and he was interested. He was thinking about him. But it never occurred to him that Jesus would pass by his little corner of the world, but it happened one day. And Jesus looked at him and said, Matthew, you come and you follow me. Now, he was a tax collector. Now, what this means is that he worked for the Romans to collect taxes. But they weren't the kind of taxes that we pay through the IRS. A little bit different, more like a toll booth collector. So there was a highway there, maybe a major intersection. They were outside the city of Capernaum, and that was a fishing village. And so as people traveled along the road, they had to pay a toll to the tax collector. Also, they were collecting duties on the, the goods and services that went through that city, including the fish. And what the Romans said was, we need a certain amount from you, and anything above that amount you can keep. <laughs> so Matthew was making bank. He was bringing the dough in. This is a big thing. When he was leaving his old life behind, he was leaving a lot of money on the table. But he did it because he needed that change. It's been said that we will not change until the cost of changing is less than the cost of the old life that we're living. Isn't that amazing? I mean, if, 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 if things are so bad that the only way they can get better is changing, well, then it becomes worth it. Now, we don't know much about Matthew. There's no detail about him. But you can do some supposing. I took supposing 101 in seminary. Then advanced supposing. I'm waiting for you to catch up, okay? So... Uh, you can start thinking about Matthew. I mean, he was working with the Romans. He was making money off of taxes taken from his own people. And the Romans used Jews to collect the taxes because they understood the customs and what people were doing, how they lived. So he was selling his own people out. People thought of him as a traitor, as someone who had betrayed his own people. And so most folks who knew Matthew hated him. He had all the money, but no one liked him. And I'm thinking that, that his only friends were other tax collectors and other people who were called sinners. Now, that's a technical term in Scripture, sinners. It means the people the Pharisees didn't like. 
They didn't keep the law perfectly, which meant everybody but Pharisees. So they may have not been bad people, but maybe they were not bad people, but they were sinners the way the Pharisees thought about them. So all of Matthew's friends were sinners. And there were some pretty rough people in there. We learn from the other Gospels that a lot of his friends were prostitutes and people in the street. And so Matthew's living a pretty rough life. And I got to think there were some broken sexual relationships, maybe some broken marriages. Because he didn't have God in his life, he was empty and maybe depressed and maybe anxious. Maybe there was alcohol in his life. It was a difficult life. And so what happened was that the, that 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 painful life was so costly to him that he saw the possibility of changing as being a, a far less cost. And so Jesus said, come and follow me. And this miracle-working rabbi who was changing so many lives, Matthew thought, he could change my life. And so he got up in that one moment and he followed Jesus. Now, although it was Matthew's choice to follow Jesus, all the power came from Christ. So as, as, as Matthew began to, to, to hang around with Jesus, he saw Jesus' example. Got, to hear, got a chance to hear Jesus' teaching. Got a chance to see Jesus' life. And the life that Jesus was living began to, to become Matthew's life. And so because he was with Jesus, everything was completely different. So when you choose to lead the life you're living, which is not working, which is so painful and begin to hang around with Jesus, everything changes because He changes you. He makes you different. Now, uh, I heard about the guy who was, was drinking a lot. But he didn't want to give it up. He just wanted to cut back, so he joined A. <laughs> I didn't want to tell you I was telling a joke. I wanted to sneak up on you. <laughs> it's a brave man who tells a joke when he knows nobody's going to laugh. That's all. But you did laugh a little bit. That's good, yeah. He joined A because he wanted to go part way. Now, here's the thing it is about alcohol or any addiction. You can't go part way. You have to give it up, and you have to walk away. The call of Jesus is not one where you can go part way with Jesus. When he calls you, you have to get up and walk away from your previous life. Now, the Bible calls that repentance. Give up the old life and walk away. You can't go part way with Jesus. You have to be all in. You know, what, what you need, you know, is not A, but you need AA. What you need is not a little bit of Jesus. You need all of Jesus. He can change your life in one moment. Now, I'm just going with the flow of the text. He can use you to influence your friends and the people around you. So your changed life might help other people that you know also change. What Matthew did after he got up to follow Jesus was what any person would do in the first century. Food was very important and it's important to Baptists too, as you know. It was very important to fellowship in the first century. What you did with people who were significant in your life was to share with them a meal. And so Matthew said, Jesus, I'm so glad to be able to follow you. I can already feel the change happening. Will you come to my house tonight? I want to have you for a meal. And not, not only for a meal, I want to be a party. Let's party like it's 33 A.D. <laughs> well, I'll have, I have all my friends come over, and they can meet you too. And so Matthew had a party at his house with Jesus as the guest of honor. And at that party, all the other tax collectors showed up. The, the, the prostitutes came. The rough people came. And Jesus loved it. He got a chance to be with the people that he came to reach and to change. And so Matthew's life that had been changed by Jesus was now being used as an influence for other people. Now, something happens to us when we get saved. We go through a process 
which is all good. People who do evangelism and study evangelism call this process redemption and lift. It sounds like a cosmetic procedure, doesn't it? I didn't go on a vacation to Florida recently. I had redemption and lift. I look good, don't I? I've been wearing a mask for a year. You, you don't even know it. Now, you look at this, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm laughing. Redemption means you're redeemed out of sin. That's the New Testament word. You're bought out of slavery to sin. That's redemption. And now you belong to God. That's a positive. That's a good. It's always a good to be redeemed. And then you're lifted. God takes you out of the situation you're in, out of the sin you're in, and gives you a whole new life. But, but the process of redemption and lift, it's a, it's a positive, it's all good, can be used by Satan as a bad. What happens is he separates you from the friends and family you knew before Jesus, and you lose your influence with them. I mean, it's understandable. I mean, you don't want to be a part of the life that you used to live. You don't want to be a part of that. And the only way you know to escape it is to leave it entirely. But when you leave it entirely, you leave your friends behind. Matthew was not leaving his friends behind. He wanted his friends to meet Jesus so they could have the chance for a radical change just like he did. The worst sinner on, on the face of the earth in redemption and lift is me because I'm a pastor. And because of the nature of my work, almost all the people I relate to are church people. You. Now, don't get me wrong. I love church people. You're my, my friends. You're my family, my brothers and sisters. But the problem with church people is they're churchy. You're good. I use that very loosely. <laughs> You're good people. And I like being, i got to be honest, I like being with good people. It's a wonderful thing. But by the nature of, of, of my life and, and being a pastor, that I don't get a chance to be with people who don't know Christ or people who may have a, a weak relationship with Jesus very often. And that, that hurts my influence with people because I don't get a chance to be with them. Yesterday I did a wedding at a wedding venue out in the oceanfront. And I thought it was going to be a beach wedding when I first went there, and I was worried about my head. Some of you understand that, you know. I thought, how can I wear a hat in this wedding? I can't, you know, that doesn't work out very well. But it turned out that it was inside, which was great because it was raining cats and dogs yesterday when the wedding service was going on. But the young lady I was marrying, she grew up in our church. In fact, there's a picture of me holding her as a baby. And uh, now she's 29. Just think how old that makes me feel. <laughs> so um, uh, she, I, I, I baptized her. I saw her come through the doors of our church on many Sundays. She, she loves the Lord still, and, and it's just a wonderful thing. So I got a chance to go out and be with her and, and not just see her say to get baptized, but now I got a chance to do a wedding ceremony. But I'm going to the ceremony, and like it is usually with weddings, I don't know 95% of the people there. And some of them were church people. I'm sure some of them weren't. Some of them were saved. I'm sure some of them weren't. And they're just acting like people act, right? They don't know me at all. They don't know me, not a bit. And so I made up my mind, as I always do at weddings, as I, as I do at funerals, I made up my mind to be an ambassador for Christ, as Paul describes his work in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so I walked around. You don't know this about me. I'm shy. You think I'm not, but I'm shy. I go home. I'm by myself. I'm happy. I'm glad to be there by myself. I'm a shy person. And so I had to learn to step out of my shyness and out of my introverted nature and talk to people. So I walked around at the wedding. I'm telling jokes. I'm smiling. Someone said, you're having a good time. Yeah, I was. I was having a great time. And I thought maybe while I was there, I, as an ambassador for Christ, I can influence people just a little bit. Because, you know, most people think that preachers, well, you know what they think preachers are, right? I don't need to tell you. That we are self-righteous, stuck-in-the-mud prigs that don't care about anybody but the Scriptures. Yeah. We yell and we scream, we talk about hell and all that. 
I just want to be an influencer of Christ. But see, what I experienced yesterday, which is too rare for me, you experience all the time. Are you listening? You're with people, not church people, but people all the time. And you get a chance to influence your family member, your brother, your sister, that cousin you haven't seen for a while, even your mom and dad or your son and daughter, you get a chance to influence them, you get a chance to go on your job where you are and because you've had a radical change in your life, that friend of yours can have a radical change in their life. You can be an ambassador for Christ, being smiling, being happy, telling jokes, but especially when that person you know is hurting, you can be there put your arm around their shoulder and say, I'm here for you. And God will give you a chance to share your faith and the radical change that you've had. And Now here's why you should work to be an influencer of people. Because Jesus came for people. That's what he came for. And as your Savior, and as your Lord came to do his work, you're just doing the work he started. He came to influence people. He came to reach people. So here he is at Matthew's party. He was kind of raucous, probably. And don't forget, by the way, that the first miracle Jesus did was at a party, a wedding party. And so the, the, here comes the, the tax collectors. Here comes the prostitutes. Here comes the rough people, the street people, the sinners. And the Pharisees are there, too. How, what they're doing there, I don't know. Who gave them an invitation? But they're there. And they start saying, how could this man who claims to be a rabbi and a holy man be eating at his sharing fellowship, you see, with these sinful people? How could, if he was really a righteous man, if he was really from God, he wouldn't be doing this. So they asked the disciples about it. How come your master's doing this? And Jesus got big ears. And he hears the question. He says, you Pharisees, listen, you understand everything about sacrifice. All the kinds of sacrifices that exist, what sacrifice to do for every sin, how to do all the things you do in your religious rigmarole. You understand all of that detail, but you've forgotten something very important. Hosea said it, speaking for God, I don't demand sacrifice, I demand mercy. You go understand the difference between mercy and sacrifice. In other words, I don't want your religion. I want you to forgive people. If God was only a God of justice, none of us here would have a chance. But He's a God of mercy. He has overlooked our sins and forgiven our sins in Jesus. The Pharisees didn't understand that. It was all about how good they were and their religion. But Jesus, he came for people. People like the people at Matthew's party. That's why he was there. Now what the Pharisees had was a God problem. Now, I don't mean that they had a problem with God, although they did. Let me explain what I'm talking about. My, my oldest granddaughter, Abigail, is three years and two months old. And we've been teaching her about prayer and about God. For a while, she went through a, it's a strange phase, I don't understand it, but she was replacing nouns and sometimes verbs with the expression num-num. And so when she prayed, she'd say, dear num-num. Now, we didn't correct her. You know, we thought this is part of her development. It, I, but I'm, I sort of call it the num-num theology. <laughs> Abigail's got a num-num theology. So uh, anyway, both Abigail and Annalise, who is 18 months old, they're, they're both praying now before the meal. So they put their hands together. And you know, Annalise is doing this. And Abigail, we actually let her say the prayer. So she, she thank, thank God for the food. Now, she calls Debbie. My name is Dawdaw. Debbie's name is Dee Dee. That's my dad, grand, grandpa name, and it's her, her grandma name. So she's Dee Dee. And so Debbie took the, the chicken breast and the French fries, put them in the air fryer. As you remember, the greatest thing ever invented, the air fryer. You remember this, right? And she brought it out. She had it on the table all cut up and ready. She had strawberries for both of them. 
And so Abigail said the prayer, thanking God for the food. And then it was over with, I started to, to do, you know, just real simple theology. So the reason we thank God, Abigail and Annalise, is because he's the one who made the food. And Abigail, using syllogisms, the you know, way of logic, she said, just matter of factly, Dee Dee is God. <laughs> Dee Dee is God. <laughs> so she, what she, what she, she, you know, she said, you know, God makes the food, Dee Dee made the food, therefore Dee Dee is God. I said, please don't encourage her. <laughs> that means walking around. <laughs> Man, I love that story a lot more than you love that story, you know. <laughs> Dee Dee is God. Well, this is, this is the God problem that, that the Pharisees had. The God problem they had was they thought they were God. Now, of course, they had a problem with God because they thought they were God. The original sin was when Adam and Eve tried to be God. And it's at the root of all of our sin that we think our rules, our ways of doing things, what we want is more important than what God wants. And so we try to be God. But the Pharisees had taken this to and, and, and made it into a, a finely constructed thing. They were God. The decisions they made were the God's decisions. The judgments they made were ju God's judgments. The, their belief, their theology were God's theology and beliefs. They became God, and they, as God, looked at these people, and they didn't measure up. And so they judged them. And what God wanted was mercy. I got time to tell another story. I was going to tell this at the early service, but I had, didn't have time, so I'll tell it to you. You want me to tell it? Okay. See, the Pharisees... They thought they were God, but they were really sinners. I, I've come not to call the righteous, but when Jesus said that, he had sarcasm dripping from his tongue. I've come not to call the righteous. You Pharisees who think you're so good, but sinners to repentance. Uh, some time ago, I had a little Honda, a little, little, little black Honda, and it was the middle of August and the air conditioning went out. So it's already a black car, right? Had no air conditioning. So what I did when I went out, I, I went to, to, to uh, have it repaired. It wasn't Finks, by the way, David. <laughs> it wasn't Finks. But uh, I went to have it repaired, and the guy said, that's, that's going to cost you $650. I said, what? <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> we had $650. So when I, when I went out, I went, we'd go by 7-Eleven, and I'd buy the biggest big gulp that they had, and I would fill it all, uh, all ice and just a little bit of Coke. And I would drive around eating the ice, drinking the Coke. And that would keep me cool enough. So it has a funeral in another place in the area. I, I didn't, wasn't doing the funeral, but I was going to the funeral because it was, it was related to a family of our church. And my wife had bought these things from QVC called Cool Danas. You put them in the fridge. And then you take them out and you put them on your neck. And you work in the yard, it keeps you cool. She said, well, Ernie, why don't you take a Cool Dana with you? Put it around your neck. As you drive to the funeral, so you got your ice, you got your cool dana, you'll get there, you'll be nice and cool. So I get in my car with the cool dana around my neck and the ice, I drive to the funeral, you know, I have a, a, a nice suit on, beautiful white shirt, nice colorful tie. And I go inside the funeral and, I'm, and, I'm, and the service goes on, and then I walk around talking to people, right? I go up to the family and say, I'm so sorry, I, I, I'm praying for you. And I see other church folks that I'm talking to them as well. I see the pastor of this, this mega church. I see this, I go up and start talking to him. And then I leave and I, and I, I stop for a moment, move the window, I mean, the mirror, excuse me, down in my car so I can, I can make sure my hair is all right because they've been out in the wind, you know. And I saw that the cool Dana had sprung a leak and I had blue dye all over my white collared shirt, down my shirt, onto my tie. I mean, it wasn't a small spot. I mean, it was this big. And I'm not exaggerating. It's this big. Uh, Y'all, are you getting this? So I'm walking around the funeral going, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? How you doing, brother? Good to see you. All that. And, no, and nobody said a word. You think somebody would have gone, <clears throat> nobody said a word. So there I am walking around with a gigantic spot on my shirt. 
I was the most embarrassed person who ever lived. <laughs> my face was as red as the dial on my shirt was blue. No, here's the thing. I got a spot on my shirt. Everybody noticed it, but I didn't know. And here are these Pharisees walking around thinking they're so righteous and Jesus saw every one of their sins and every one of their hypocrisies, every one. And they thought they could judge other people. But that's not you. That's not you. You had a rad If you know Christ, you've had a radical change in your life. If you know Jesus, you know that he gave you that change, not just so you could go to heaven, which is a wonderful thing, and not just so you could walk with him every day, which is a tremendous thing, but you're also going to be influenced on people around you to help them understand how powerful, how wonderful the life of Christ is because Christ came for people, and you should be here for people too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this story about Matthew is so powerful to us. How this man had an empty life despite his money and knew that what he needed was a change. And when Jesus said, come follow me, he did. And he became a disciple of Jesus, one of the twelve. A man who had as his mission in life being an evangelist to Jews. A man who wrote his gospel, the gospel of Matthew for Jewish people. And you changed the world because of what Matthew could do as a changed man. And so he made it, became an influencer of people. We want to be an influencer of people. Because your son Jesus, your son Jesus, he came for people. We're here for people too. Right now, Father, maybe somebody who's listening online or somebody who, uh, who's here who wants to have that change, and I pray they'll pray this prayer with me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. Will you come and live inside of me by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that I might know that I'm saved? And I pray this in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, let me know on the form that you find, a little sheet of paper, a little card in the chair. Talk to one of our online counselors. Whether you're here at this location, West Portion location, whether you're watching online, let us know about your decision. And now, Father, we pray that what happened in this story will influence us to change and then influence other people. That's our prayer we make in Jesus' name. Amen.